continental shelf under the ocean. You have the continental shelf and then it goes down to the depths of the ocean. And in that were kind of like ravines, sort of, or canyons. Mm -hmm. And geologists had a theory that a megaquake would make undersea earth slides on that and it would leave a record. And so they were able to study the effects of the Alaska earthquake and see that that was so. So they drilled off like Washington State, okay, into these ravines right at the edge of the continental shelf. That's how they found it. It shook itself out plus nine earthquakes 18 times. It was right there in the layers, pal, okay? Okay, well, now, that's an then. average of about 500 and something years between mm -hmm. shakeouts. Mm -hmm. Guess, you know when the last one was? Uh, uh, Christmas Day. 500 years ago, right? Well, we got a little while ways to go. We're in the zone, though. It, it was Christmas Day, 1700. Or uh, 1699, 1700, 1699. Oh, yeah, we right. dated precisely. Not only that, geologically we dated. Well, we can dig up the, the redwoods that were buried in the tsunami tidal wave now. now and, and, of course, they're dated and now that we know what we're looking for and that, in fact, is what happened. Okay. Hey, I don't know, tell you about Rainier. Hey, I, you got to go see Mount St. Helens. That's the most awesome site you have ever seen, okay? They say it was equivalent to 400 atom bombs. You'll believe it when you see that. I, I, oh, I've hiked up into right into the blast zone, actually, to, to where the road ends and right up there where the blast came right out where you see it. How, uh, how close to the earthquake? I remember from when the uh, volcano blew where you up there. Oh, that was in uh, 95, so I was... So the trees had almost grown back by then? No! No. They hadn't? No. 95? 15 years after. No. Holy it still looked like the moon. You were still now, then, you were just still now, then, seeing a few sprigs. Uh, those places are deserts, man, to begin with. All out, all about west, unless you're on the east side of the uh, uh, Olympic Mountains, which is only a coastal strip of about 100 miles. That's real green and rain. Uh, the rest of Washington and Oregon are, are deserts. <laughs> they are. Yeah, yeah. They grow a lot of stuff because they're irrigated uh, heavily. And all those states are just basically volcano deserts. You, if, if you go and drive through uh, western Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington State, except for that coastal strip, you'll see that all of that, you'll come to realize that this place is all volcanic. Everything there is volcanic. Every, the, all the rocks are volcanic. Uh, there's no dirt out there. It's just kind of volcanic ash. You throw your duffel bag down, and it goes poof. <laughs> you know, really fucks up your back. You 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 can uh, immediately realize this place is going to blow the fuck up one of these days. Okay, what about Mount Rainier, man? They, I mean, they got Mount Rainier just looms over over Seattle. Okay, the, the the western face of Mount Rainier is just rotten. It's just really mud and rocks glued together with uh, ice frozen ice. All that has to do is be heated. Mm -hmm. And and you'll have these huge or lahars. They're called lahars. The, mo the mud flows. Mm -hmm. That mud flow that killed 40,000, 50,000 people down in South America about 15 years ago. You remember that little girl was trapped in it and they tried to get her out of Guatemala or Venezuela? Um, I'll try. God, I can't remember. You're obviously well traveled. You've been you've been several places. Uh, you know, anyway, the point is, listen, but Again, I'm not judging you because I understand you're doing the best you can to handle your psychic load. You're doing the... You've well, got it couldn't have been that much for you because after a while, then you get kind of a... I know you had a Camaro for a little bit, so... That was in the... Was that in the 70s? 1980. I got 80. a brand new Camaro. Was it Smokey and the Bandit type? Or? Uh, it looked like it, although it was just a six-cylinder, but it was a California Camaro in the Van Nuys California Assembly plants. So white, clean, black, no clean. Well, what made the move? What did you do to get that? Just out of curiosity. Were you oh, still working in marketing? or? Uh, well, no. I, I, uh, I started fraudulent telephone solicitation in uh, after I got up here within about a... On your own? On oh, my own. Just printing invoices and selling them. Oh, okay. Just printing, making up. Southeast Regional Council, Georgia. Yeah. During that time, did you, you were making good money doing that? Well, yeah, but I was so drunk that, sick drunk, I stayed sick drunk until uh, September 77. September and, and then I quit. Yeah. But cold turkey or did you go to rehab? Or no, no, I did. I, I got uh, medical help on that. Uh, Where'd you get that at? A private doctor, and I can't. Downtown. He's downtown Decatur, and um, 
What I had been doing was going to Grady because my blood pressure had gotten so sky high, just tremendously high, like 145 over 115, just tremendously high. And uh, I was doing that, but uh, the handwriting was on. They were giving me experimental drugs, et cetera, et cetera. I had a couple of convulsions, and the handwriting was on the wall. And I got married to a prostitute. And on the day I got married, you know, I, I met and courted her and married her drunk. <laughs> and the day we got married, I quit. You know, bad mistake. <laughs> we only stayed married six months. What was her name? You remember her? Uh, yeah, Yvonne. Yvonne uh, Ball was her name. Oh, her, her real name, her whole name was Donna Yvonne Ball, but she went by. Diana? Dinah. Dinah? Dinah. Like Dinah. Man Ball? Yvonne with a Y. Okay. Yvonne. Is, uh, is she still around or is she? I haven't seen her for decades, twenty over 20 years. I, I ran into her on uh, Highlands uh, 20 years ago. I was running, you know, mm -hmm. down the street and I ran into her. And uh, we, I just said a few words, hi, how are you doing? And I uh, said, you're working. And what I mean is, did she have a job? Right. But in retrospect, <laughs> <laughs> in retrospect, and she said, mm hmm <laughs> And looking back on it, I realized how, really, she took that, that question to me. And right. she said, yes. <laughs> and, so she was still probably. And, yeah, and I uh, said, oh, see ya. <laughs> and I would have just, went, I, I didn't know what else to say to her. Right. The poor thing, I, I just felt so she, she didn't have a chance in the world, that poor girl. Yeah. She is so dumb, man. She tried to listen to her rings, and she was too dumb to get in. How old, Literally. How was she when you guys got married? Uh, she was about my age, and we got married in 77, so that would have put her about 31. 31. All right. And, uh, but at any rate, I quit drinking. But the problem is, uh, and I stayed, uh, I stayed sober for, uh, I stayed sober. I fell off the wagon for six months in uh, 82, quit again, and, and uh, stayed sober until uh, 1985, uh, 1995, I'm sorry. Then I stayed drunk for four years till 89, and I haven't had a single drink since 89. But the first time I quit, yes, I went to a private doctor. He put me on Melaril. Um, it's called an antidepressant, but... You remember the doctor's name, by Nah, gold something, but Man. don't they all have gold steam, gold right. bar, gold, <laughs> you know, whatever. You, you, married, know. you married again in 79, didn't you? Yeah, and uh, in 79, again, I was married for six months. And so you were, I'm sorry, you were only married to Dinah for how long? Six months. We were divorced in about uh, March, April of 78. And then I married the police officer, Sue, that Stone Mountain Police Department. Mm -hmm. And by the way, she was grandfathered in, so she was, uh, she, in other words, she was a police officer before post. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, so she was not a post-certified officer, although the department, well, then the law had been passed. You, it, you know, right. Everyone had to be post to be a blue light police officer. Right. But she had started before them, so she was grandfathered in. And at the time I was going with her or uh, married to her, she was not post-certified. However, she was a blue light police officer. And you had met her there in the park? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was running there every day, and I was really good, looking good and every, in great shape. And uh, uh, after, after we were divorced in uh, late 79, uh, I started taking pills again. And the rationale was, hey, I'm not drinking. Uh, but I'll just take every pill I can get. Mm -hmm. And that was in the uh, waning days of the Quaaludes craze. Right. As a matter of fact, you can even still get real lower Quaaludes. Uh, the DEA, one guy in the DEA persuaded the four or five people in the world that made methoqualine hydrochloride to just con discontinue production. Okay. The same guy, and, and that, there was no more Quaaludes, real Quaaludes. And then they were all counterfeit made typically of diazepam, which is Valium. Right. And they were great. They were great. I estimate some of those counterfeit quaaludes made of diazepam probably, probably at, uh, um, perhaps even up to 500 milligrams of diazepam in it. And as you know, it comes in 5, 10, 15, 20 milligram gaps, you know. <laughs> and, and I estimate some of those had, had up to, to, to five. I mean, they were instant white lightning. I mean, you take a, <laughs> take a whole one in, and 
if you were an experienced down freak, you'd stay on your feet and would go, oh, do all kinds of things, but you wouldn't remember a damn thing of it later. Mm -hmm. I mean, these were wild. I've, I've woken up after a night of doing those things, walked out to my Camaro, seen that I had my spare on it, looked into the trunk and seen my original tire was totally shredded, totally to pieces, and then in a couple of hours have a guy from the noon, you know, I lived in Stone Mountain, have a guy from Noonday Baptist Church at Highway 5 and 92 at Woodstock call me and tell me he found my wallet in the church parking lot. <laughs> okay, I had no business up at Woodstock, number one. I had a shredded tire and no no remorse at all of changing it out and putting the spare up. Mm -hmm. And a guy has found my wallet in a Noonday Baptist Church in Woodstock, you know, 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you can only think of God only knows what happened that night and how many people <laughs> I ran over or what, you know, that rear, that tire was shredded so much it was like, yeah, God, you know, hit a curve at 100 miles an hour. Mm. It was wild. It was wild. Yeah, those those were wicked, totally wicked. Mm. And um, so, so you started doing this while you were married to Steve? No, or? no, 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 okay. no, no. I wouldn't take a pill or nothing while I was married. I was in my 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 rebirth when you start running you see i had a, a lot of strength uh is or foreknowledge as far as being able to run long distances because i learned in the army in a class of 600 guys okay now and that is that your average guy if he's young in good health and not obese your average guy can go out and run for an astonishing like long time if you'll do an lsd long slow distance mm -hmm. okay don't spread just dog trot, you know, or just do it like they do in the army, it's just hop, tuck, tuck. one shot. Yeah, 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 exactly. That your average guy, that if he's motivated, he can go out and do an astonishing amount of distance, and as, as you get trained up, you can, so I knew that, that was my, the average civilian doesn't know that, right. and they think as soon as they start into a double time, they go, oh, how long, oh, am I getting tired, oh, this is getting, you know, and they don't, they haven't seen, but you see in the army with 600 guys doing it, that's, that shows me that you can that 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 is highly subjective. Your your tolerance to be yeah highly subjective in that you can do it because everyone else is doing it. That 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 proves that the how subjective fatigue is. That's what I learned about fatigue in the army. That was able to carry me through all my athletic endeavors all through my life. The incredible stuff that I've done in the 90s, as far as powerlifting 30 mile trips, you know. And carrying heavy weight, climbing three, four, or five thousand vertical feet in a trip over thirty miles, just doing stuff that that people are really impressed by. That that know what it means. But see, my secret weapon is that I knew that fatigue was highly subjective, and that it can. In other words, what by subjective I mean your response to fatigue is highly dependent on states of mind, of your state of mind. Right. And I learned that in the army. I learned that because. In the army, I saw that I could do stuff that astonished myself and everyone else astonished themselves. And the reason we did it is because we did it together. And he could do it. That's an airborne song, you know. If I can do it, you can do it. If he can do it, you can do it. You know. And you know, up the hill, around, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I learned that in the army. So I was able to start running in uh, 1978. And uh, and I met my wife through the money. I was out. Uh, running at Stone Mountain. Yeah, she would drive by and never would wear a shirt, even in winter time. Had the hairy chest and, you know, cut. I was lifting weights every other day and running 10 miles or, or more every other day. Yeah, she'd drive by in the police car. She'd put the intercom on, you know, the loudspeaker, or the loud, not the intercom, the, uh, broad, the, the loudspeaker, mm -hmm. you know. Well, they say, all right, everybody, just dis disperse, you know, <laughs> this show's over. <laughs> and she put put that loudspeaker on, you know, off the top, and she goes, mm, mm, like that. <laughs> and she'd drive by. Oh, yeah, she just scarred me right up, mm. man. She scarred me. I was her fourth husband, man. She knew how to do it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, she scarred me right up because, you know, she, she, got, she got the feel for me. She found out I had VA benefits. And she wanted a home, of course, more than anything. What do all women want? They want their home and things, and they want their kids. Okay, that's what they want. And uh, so she would just die for a house, and die for a house. And when she found out I had... She had ten? Two, a six and eight. And when she found out that I had uh, 115000 at the time, VA loan gear, which would be equivalent of 300000 now. This is in 78, that's two or three times mm -hmm. the money was. And so that was enough, you know. Oh. 
And so, yeah, uh, she got me married and went out and found the house. Got a good deal on it, too. Bought a house across from the school in Decatur, right. Hollywood Drive. Bought that house. It had been sit sitting empty. I happen to know the guy that know me because he lived in the same apartment complex I lived in uh, before I, I married her. And uh, bought that house for 35000 then. And this was in 79, and that's just when those big real estate inflations hit then. That, that, those real estate, that inflation of the late 70s, finally the President uh, Carter had to put a cap on... Uh, that's back when they had 13% on your house and stuff like that. Oh, that's yeah, great. yeah, yeah. And, but the inflation rates were so... Even going back to Gerald Ford, he had the Quick Inflation Now program. Went. Anyway, those inflations of, of the late 70s was the best thing that ever happened to the middle class because that meant... In five years, their, their home would, would, would double because just of inflation, the, the price. And you may say, well, inflation, the money's only worth half as much. Well, so what? Uh, you know, if your home is worth 100000 in 75 and in 79 or 78 is worth 200000 well, so what if the money was only worth half as much? You still had the 100000 <laughs> <laughs> Right? Okay. Yeah. You still had the 100000 Okay. So, yeah. So she bought that thing, she stole it from the guy. He had gotten a divorce and been sitting there. She saw it just sitting there like this, or it is sitting there and sitting there and everything. She got that house for 35000 When we split up, uh, got divorced six months later, we sold the, the first, we advertised, I, I advertised, she wanted to get another five or another two or three. I, I just, I said, I got a flying hair at my ass. I said, let's advertise it at 45 mm -hmm. And bigger than shit, we advertised it at 45, and the first person that inquired on it bought it at 34.5. He asked for 500 dollars. That guy was Steve Rock, who uh, whose mother uh, was a real estate agent who started for sale by owner, mm -hmm. the for sale by owner. Now there's a lot of for sale, but the for sale by owner. Yeah, well, yeah. So he was buying it for people in California. So you guys had a had a. We got we made ten grand off that house in six months. Mm -hmm. A friendly breakup though. I mean, you know, oh yeah, it wasn't a not yeah. It was, it was, oh no. Okay. Oh no. I've always been fair to my my ex wives mm -hmm. And oh no, no, she didn't. No, when I bought that house, I bought it in my name. But she was my wife, and she came to the closing uh, of the house, and so I bought it in my name. You know, VA. And at the closing, I said, Sue, do you want half that house? And she said, yeah. So I told the attorney, can I give her half that house? He said, yeah, I'll make you a quick claim deed right now. And I gave her half the house. Okay. And I thought it was fair because she's the one that went out and got it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't have had it. Right. I wouldn't have made the 10000 you know. So, you know, I, when we sold the house, I was, I was uh, willingly uh, gave her her half of the proceeds. But you were in an apartment before that, kind of on yeah, your own? Yeah, just a 